Good morning. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to today's workshop on racism and its implications for clinical research. Um, my name is uh, Julia Kofler. Uh, I'm a neuropathologist here at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm also the co-director of our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, or ADSC uh, for short. Um, today's program was put together uh, in response and in recognition of all the challenges that we face daily in the ADSC with achieving uh, racial equity in both the clinical as well as the research setting as it comes to uh, our population of patients with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. However, um, these challenges are by no means specific to us. Um, they are recognized on a national level. They are also increasingly addressed by our funding agencies and they are shared by many of our colleagues across the health sciences uh, in their own uh, patient populations. We are therefore very pleased to open this program today to the broader uh, university community. And thank you all for joining us uh, today. So today's program is not specific to Alzheimer's disease, but it's a general discussion of all the challenges that we face as it comes to uh, dealing with racism. Uh, today's workshop uh, is co-sponsored by our NIH-funded uh, ADSC and Down syndrome grants. And I would like to extend my special thanks to Drs. Jennifer Lingler, Beth Shavan, and Melita Terry from our Outreach and Education Corps, and to Dr. Maria Brown, the Associate Dean for Equity, Engagement, and Justice at the Dental School, for their efforts in organizing today's workshop and for bringing together a really wonderful and exciting uh, panel of speakers. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to participate and for sharing their views and insights with us today. Uh, with that, I would like to hand over the reins to Melita Terry, uh, who the meeting started today. Um, with that, I would like to wish you all a very uh, engaging and um, a fruitful uh, workshop uh, today. Thank you, Julia. Hello and welcome again to the Racism and Its Implications in Clinical Research, a workshop to promote understanding and action Thank you again for joining. We know that medicine and clinical research have a long history of racism. Working to change systems and structures to eliminate systemic racism in clinical research requires us to learn more about it, willingly engage in difficult dialogue, and commit to a justice-oriented anti-racist praxis in our own research work. We are happy that we are holding an online academic workshop to address the implications and impacts of systemic racism on clinical research and actions for how to begin to address it. I would like to now introduce one of our planning committee members and also a advisory community advisory board member of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Maria Brown, who is the inaugural Associate Dean for Equity, Engagement and Justice and Associate Professor in the School of Pharmacy at the University of Pittsburgh. He is the immediate past director of the Office of Health Sciences, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Schools of the Health Sciences. Mr. Brown is an affiliate faculty member of the Center of Health Equity in the Graduate School of Public Health and a past faculty fellow in the Center for Urban Education in the School of Education. He is a certified diversity practitioner and a certified health education specialist and holds a BS in biology and a BS in medical technology from Salem University and a master's degree in public health from the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health. And currently pursuing his doctorate of education in administrative and policy studies at Pitt School of Education. Mr. Brown serves on the various community and professional boards and committees, including Pennsylvania Department of Health COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force and is the co Chair of the Community Research Advisory Board, CRAB, at Pitt School of Public Health Center for Health Equity. Mario, it is our pleasure to introduce you to our audience and attendees. Pass the mic to you if you wouldn't mind introducing our first featured speaker of today's workshop. Thank you. Absolutely, Ms. Terry. Thank you very much for that, for that gracious introduction. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you all. I'm so happy that uh, this day has come so that we may have this dialogue, a very important dialogue indeed. 
Um, it is my pleasure to serve as the uh, Associate Dean uh, in the School of Pharmacy. And it is really my pleasure to introduce uh, our very first keynote speaker for the day, Dr. Stephen B. Thomas. I uh, hold Dr. Thomas, I consider him a friend, a mentor and a colleague. We've done uh, some great work together in the past and uh, hope to do more in the future. So with that being said, uh, Dr. Thomas is the professor of health policy, is the professor of health policy and management director in the Center for Health Equity at the University of Maryland. He is one of the nation's leading scholars in the effort to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities. Dr. Thomas has applied his expertise to address a variety of conditions from which minorities generally face poor, far poor uh, health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and HIV AIDS. Dr. Thomas has received numerous awards for his professional accomplishments. And over the years, his work has become recognized as one of the scholarly contributions leading to the 1997 Presidential Apology to Survivors of the, of the Syphilis Study done at Tuskegee. His current research focuses on the translation of evidence-based science on chronic disease and community-based interventions designed to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare. More specifically, he is focused on understanding how social context shapes attitudes and behaviors of underserved, poorly served, and never served segments of our society towards participation in health promotion and disease prevention activities. Please help me welcome Dr. Stephen B. Thomas. Welcome, Dr. T. Hey, Mario. Hey. I am telling you, it is an honor and a pleasure to be back in Pittsburgh, even if it's only virtual. I'm looking at the Cathedral of Learning behind you and rem reminding myself of what it meant to have that skyline. And uh, so uh, an honor and a pleasure to be uh, here. Um, many of you know I was at the University of Pittsburgh from 2000 to 2010 before heading to Maryland. And I want you to know in many ways that uh, over the horizon of that time period, much of what we started in Pittsburgh is now matured in a way that, that um, I think can be sustained. And more importantly, look what the pandemic has, has shown us. It pulled back the curtain and all the broken places. We knew we're there, right, Mario? But now it's front and center and even captured the attention of the White House. So um, I'm gonna take a chance here and, um, and uh, share my screen. And uh, Mario, every now and then I'm gonna call on you to say, uh, yeah, yeah. I can see the screen. I'm gonna to talk to you to make sure all this technology works. You know, it's, it's really great when it works. <laughs> but uh, let, me, uh, let me take a chance here and uh, hit a button. And, and once again, say uh, what an honor and a pleasure uh, to be back at Pitt. And uh, you know, what's interesting, Mario, is that much of what I'm going to share uh, has its birthplace right there in Pittsburgh the work that we did all over the city. And, um, and so, as you can see from the title, uh, Clinical Research COVID-19 Pandemic on Building Trusted Community Engaged Research. Mario, one of the things I've realized is that every year my freshman class is still 18, <laughs> but every year I get older. And, uh, and increasingly, uh, people uh, may not know who this image is here. This is an undergrad student who produced this for the 50 year anniversary of the March on Washington. But every year, uh, Mario, uh, increasingly, I got students who scratch their head, who, who is this? And I'm realizing that we cannot take for granted what people are learning in school about the civil rights movement. In fact, can you imagine that as we're talking today, there's fights in school boards right now about what black history to teach and what not to teach? amazing. We have students that come from all over the world. We don't know to what extent the history of Black people in America was part of their, their education and training in Thailand or China or wherever they have come from, their country of origin. And we have faculty and staff that come from all over the world. So I think we have to constantly remind ourselves how we have gotten where we are today. Clearly, we've made progress. Yes, we have a long way to go. But the path forward is through the lessons from the civil rights movement. At the end of the day, it's all about love, Mario. We got to care about the people in the community. 
and they know the difference between a transaction and a relationship. I say it's all about relationship. So I'm going to say some things today that everyone may not agree with. That's good. These are complicated issues. We shouldn't assume we're going to agree on everything. But let's agree not to be disagreeable with one another. If there's anything we need now more than ever, Mario, it's kindness. Can you imagine people fighting in airports, being disrespectful to servers and restaurants? And I mean, what has happened to us? The pandemic is making us all reflect on where we are, who we are, and where we're going and how we're going to get there. I don't want to make sure that we all get there. I remember in the early days, Mario, they used to say that the COVID is a big storm and we're all in it together. And I remember that in the early days, uh, that admonition, we're all in this together. But you know what, Mario, we may all be in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some people got speed boats, some people on cruise liners, uh, some people are on yachts, and you got other people in rafts and inner tubes, and you got some people just floating out there all on their own. So we've got to get back to the common good, back to each one reach one, back to nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Nobody's healthy until everybody's healthy because we can't get there and leave whole segments of our society behind. So around the edges of this image you see here on the screen is uh, the examples of the work that we're doing here in Maryland and around the country to translate the science of medicine and public health into culturally tailored community-based interventions. And to, again, pull back the curtain on the fact that we're talking about, uh, you pick the research topic, let's pick Alzheimer's, for example. Nine out of 10 people on the street, Mario, if you were to stop and ask them who gets Alzheimer's, Black people may not be the top of the list. So how is it that we have a disease that disproportionately impacts Black people, but most people don't know that. They don't see that as a health disparity. Is that good or is that bad? You say, well, if it's perceived as a black disease, it may be bad because it won't get resources. That tells us something about the society we live in. So let's tell some truth here about where we are and where we need to go. And I think that uh, clinical research um, is part of the answer moving forward, but we have to look in the mirror ourselves to reflect on how our profession, uh, how, how our institutions have left in some cases, a, a negative taste uh, in the very communities that need us the most. So as you can see around the, the surface there from, from, the, from the Mona Center Community Garden, that started out as a community garden, uh, Armario, now it is an official urban farm. And we'll talk about how we turned a vacant parking lot into an urban farm. But it's really gonna be the Barbershop Health Initiative, again, with its origins right there in Pittsburgh, I wanna share with you as some of the examples and the legislation that we've passed here in Maryland to really address issues of unconscious bias. Okay, so here we go. Uh, just recently, Mario, did that screen change? Yes, it did, Dr. Here, very good. Recovering from COVID-19, Prince George's County, uh, University of Maryland is in Prince George's County. Almost a million people in this county, Mario. 60% are Black people, 20% Hispanic. We have the the, um, we are majority minority county. And the other distinction is the wealthiest majority black county in the United States. And yet we are not protected from COVID because of that. In fact, um, Prince George's County is one of the hotspots in the state of Maryland, along with Baltimore City and Montgomery County. Uh, we just released our major report on uh, the issues in addressing uh, COVID. And you'll see there are four major recommendations. And I just want to zero in on number two, humanize delivery and communication strategies for COVID vaccines. Why do we have to put the word humanize on there? It's because we have lost touch with the human component. You can't just give people statistics uh, and risk ratios. You have to humanize that. And I'm going to show you what some of that looks like. Because right now we have 
large segments of our community running to social media, trusting, you know, a friend that they have on Facebook more than they trust their doctor. Why? Because of that humanizing personal connection. Trust matters more than facts. And so, Mario, you may remember this, you were part of this, building trust between minorities and researchers. This work was started in Pittsburgh and uh, it is now an online interactive uh, training program that addresses the needs of both the community and the research community. And so, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, training modules for researchers, uh, for the, excuse me, for the community, uh, enhancing minority engagement and research. We have, as you can see, there are five modules. These are online training modules. And on becoming a self-reflective researcher, successfully engaging minority communities. And we have seven modules there. And Mario, I would love to be able to come back and literally deliver this training to the research community there at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, I had a lot of epi slides. I took them all out, Mario, because you all, everybody out in that audience knows the epi slides. You've all sat in meetings with graphs and charts. We know the problem, but we don't understand the context of the problem, in my opinion. We don't understand why does it continue to fuel itself? Why, why did the pandemic really expose the broken parts of our healthcare delivery system, our inability to deliver to the people the very success of science that's come out of our labs, come out of our clinical research. It's the social context of health disparities. And it's in that that we can't just focus on biological systems. We have to ultimately uncover the social, cultural, and environmental factors beyond the biomedical model and address a broad range of issues, uh, including but not limited to breaking the cycle of poverty, increasing access to quality healthcare, eliminating environmental hazards in homes and neighborhoods, and implementing effective prevention programs tailored to specific community needs. You can't take a brochure and just put it in Spanish and say this is for the Latinx community. You can't take a, 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 a poster and just put a black face on it. You literally have to tailor the communication to the historical context of the neighborhoods that you want to reach. And in Pittsburgh, as you know, Mario, all the neighborhoods have uh, their own unique history. That was one of the beautiful things about the city. And therefore, you'd have different communication strategies in the Hill District than you'd have on the north side, tied to the history of those spaces. And if we want this little girl's future to be bright, if we want to give her a chance. Yes, we have to listen to Martin Luther King, but we also have to listen to Frederick Douglass. And uh, this statue is on the University of Maryland campus uh, here in College Park. We're nine miles from the White House. This is front of the McKilden Library, and we call this Freedom Square. Frederick Douglass said, and I quote, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who favor and profess, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Mario, when we look at the disparities in COVID, when we see the fights at school boards, when we see people arguing over vaccine men, that's the mighty roar of the oceans. Our scientists came out of the laboratory with a vaccine in what can only be described as miracle time, miracle time, okay? And we can't get it into the arms of our people? We should be ashamed. But this is our pivot to make things better. And so let's see if we can agree on some things. We've all been in workshops, Mario, where we'll spend the entire workshop on definitions. Let's see if we can agree on some things and then move forward to action. So words we use do matter, definitions matter. And while some differences in definitions may reflect only stylistic preferences, others convey values and beliefs that can be used explicitly or implicitly to justify and promote particular views, 
policies and practices. So resist the effort to change the word from disparity to difference. Yes, there was an effort in federal government documents when they came out with their health disparity reports, they changed the word from disparity to health difference. That takes away the very essence of what we're dealing with, especially when we talk about the issue of the theme of this workshop, issues of racism. So when we talk about health disparity, we don't have to go far. We can look at Healthy People 2020, Healthy People 2030. Uh, the fact is that a health disparity is a particular type of health difference that's closely linked to socioeconomic and environmental disadvantage. It's not just a difference. It's a difference caused by the very racism and structural discrimination that we're talking about. And that health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So just think of the healthiest people in your city and ask why, uh, well, well, set that as the bar for everybody else. It is the highest attainment of health for all people. So health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And all we have to do is look at what happened with the rollout of the COVID vaccines to realize that many communities face barriers in accessing that life-saving vaccine. And we need to address those barriers because they're the same ones that we face in the areas of chronic disease as well. So for the purpose of measurement, because I know we have some statisticians out there and some program evaluators out there, health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants that adversely affect excluded or marginalized groups. There's the key, excluded or marginalized groups. That's what we mean when we're doing health equity research. If an effort does not address poverty, discrimination, or the health damaging consequences of groups of people who have historically been excluded or marginalized, then it's probably not a health equity effort, okay? So if you're dealing with the worried well, if you're dealing with the people who have access to computers and who can come to meetings in the middle of the day, <laughs> you're probably, maybe don't call that health equity. It's when you're out in the after hours, Mario, you know, after five in the community, when you're out on the weekends, on the Saturday and the Sunday, all right? Because that's where the people are you're trying to reach. That's what we need to do. We have to pivot our systems to address the needs of the most vulnerable. So it's in that context that history matters. And as you can see here in the images on the screen, uh, these are simply examples of the history of research abuse. In fact, uh, racism in medicine and public health would be easy to ignore if it wasn't so well documented. But now, Mario, with the social media, you don't have to wait two years for a book to come out. It's like a snap of a finger and you got movies and podcasts. And, and so our communities are consuming this information and we need to be aware of it when we go there. Everybody's heard about the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, but Mario, I am so old. <laughs> I remember when it wasn't taught in school. When I would ask students in my undergrad class, have you ever heard of it? No hands would go up. You ask that question now, every hand would go up. Henrietta Lacks, every hand goes up because Oprah made the movie about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Why are they, why did they just put up a statue in, in London in honor of Henry at a lax, our stories, our stories that go around the world, my friend. And it is connecting that common humanity that we need to get back to. But we can't get back there if we don't look in the mirror ourselves. And so, as you all know, uh, in 1932, uh, 1972, the Tuskegee syphilis study took place. Look at this image from the archives. Uh, the doctor's smiling. And the people are looking on with some curiosity, but it's not as if they're terrorized. What did this physician do? He met them where they were, Mario. Are we not telling people to meet people where they are? He put his equipment in the back of his US Public Health Service car and drove to the cotton fields and literally drew his samples out in the field. They used anthropologists to understand the dynamics of the community. And, and they use that information to actually get them in to 
participate in the longest non-therapeutic experiment on humans in the history of medicine. And yes, some of that history has its origins right there at the University of Pittsburgh. And maybe in the discussion, we can talk about that. And the reckoning that has already taken place on your campus directly related to this legacy. Now, I was honored to be invited to the White House in 1997 when President Bill Clinton issued the formal apology. And he said, the people who ran the study at Tuskegee diminished the stature of man by abandoning the most basic ethical precepts. They forgot their pledge to heal and repair. They had the power to heal the survivors and all the others, and they did not. Today, all we can do is apologize, end quote. An apology means I'm sorry from a president who wasn't even alive in 1932. What we need to do is move towards atonement, which means making things better. And I submit to you, Mario, that our effort to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities at this workshop itself is part of that atonement. In 1972, this editorial cartoon ran in newspapers all across the country. On that day, the study was still going on. It was not us in the medical and public health arena that stopped this study. It was journalism. It was a newspaper story. And notice it says free autopsy, free burial plus $100. And it says secret study. It was never a secret. They published articles in journals with titles like 20 year retrospective of untreated syphilis on the Negro male. Some of your senior physician scientists there at Pitt actually may in their training have come across some Tuskegee patients. It's quite fascinating, the whole work there. But here again, it's now part of the cultural memory in these communities, from the movie of Miss Evers Boys to the jazz CD called Tuskegee Experiments by Don Byron. And can you believe this, Mario? A Marvel comic book, a Marvel comic book. It is now in the cultural memory of our communities. They may not be able to give you date and time and facts and how many people were in the study. It doesn't matter. By word of mouth, they've been told to be wary, be cautious when they come to you in white coats. They serve, they're here to help you. And we should not disarm them because their, their wariness has been earned. We have to earn their trust back by making things better. So we have an ethical responsibility. And in the aftermath of these atrocities, we had not only apologies, but new guidelines for the conduct of human subjects research in the Belmont Report. Uh, we operate on these principles right now, Mario. Uh, respect for persons. This is why you have to have informed consent. Beneficence, the risk of the research cannot outweigh the benefits and justice. We don't talk enough about justice, Mario. Justice means those who bear the burden of research should not be denied the benefit. Now let's extend that. Those who bear the burden of disease should not be denied the benefit of research. We need to focus on the ethical principle of justice. And here's just another way of looking at that by Thomas McCormick. It's all about fairness. It's all about that common good, Mario. It's a, the essence of public health is the common good that sometimes we sacrifice individual rights and liberties to protect the community as a whole. And there's nothing like an infectious disease to make that clear. And yet we're fighting ourselves. We're fighting against ourselves to actually implement what we know could work. And so if someone in the audience says, oh, that was way back then, what about today? Well, you don't have to go far. Uh, how about the New England Journal of Medicine? Let's start there, where they had physicians. Uh, and I've met these physicians who, who say, I don't look at race. I look at the data. I look at the chart. I look at the, the biospecimens. I make my decisions on facts. And so, okay, facts. Here are the black patients. Here are the white patients, male and female. Guess what? The researchers gave them a clinical chart that was identical in terms of the uh, the the black and white female had identical charts, the black and white males had identical charts. And the question was, who would get the um, referral uh, for cardiac, cardiac catheterization? And uh, 
anybody out there who's of a certain age knows that cardiac catheterization can save your life, okay? That's early detection, early intervention. Well, you probably already know the story, right? Uh, the last thing you wanted to do is be a black woman in this group because they were least likely to be referred for their cardiac catheterization. Now we can debate the methods and all the other things going on here, but this is the New England Journal of Medicine, okay? So let's have a robust debate afterwards. But the fact of the matter is that implicit bias is real. And if you had any doubt, then let's fast forward to December 27, 2020, when a physician, Dr. Susan Moore, finds herself with COVID ends up in the hospital, no white coat on, no stethoscope around her neck, just a black woman in a hospital bed. She had to pull out her cell phone, Mario. She had to go to FaceTime, Mario, to tell the people what was happening to her in her hospital bed. Her education, her degrees did not protect her. Don't forget her. Don't forget her name, say her name, Dr. Susan Moore. We got a problem people, but we can fix it. And so here in the state of Maryland, it's one thing to have the research to acknowledge implicit bias exists and here's how it shows itself. Well, in Maryland, we have passed a law and the law requires, this is the public health implicit bias training and, uh, and the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. In the state of Maryland, the law requires healthcare professionals to receive implicit bias training in order to renew their licenses after 2022, okay? So you need, uh, uh, it's not enough to know, we must do. And in this case, sometimes you have to put laws in place to make it happen. So I'm heading to the finish line, Mario, and I say we need some warp speed. You know that warp speed, if people want to criticize warp speed, oh, they did it too fast. It was miracle time. I think the longest, uh, the fastest before uh, COVID was like four years to come up with the measles vaccine. I'm sure somebody out there can correct the record. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we did this in a matter of months. Unprecedented, Mario. But how did that happen? When you talk to the scientists, they say, we didn't cut any scientific corners. We removed red tape. We paid the companies for research and development before they even had a product. We paid the companies for their market share before they had a market. We removed all of the bureaucracy and that's how we got this. Well, how about applying some warp speed strategy to community engagement, Mario? How about, how about getting the community their resources in advance of the outcomes? How about not putting them always on a cost reimbursement model where they have to spend money to get reimbursed? And how about a fourth generation approach to health disparities research? We published our uh, work in the annual review, review of public health in 2011. And it goes like this. In fact, this whole framework has a, has a, has a pit DNA footprint on it. Uh, first generation documenting the existence of disparities. Mario, you don't have to leave your office. You can do this with a good computer and a data set. Second generation explain the reasons. Oh, they live in a food desert. They don't have access to health care. They're poor. Okay, great analytics. But again, you don't have to leave your uh, house to do that. Third generation research. Those are the randomized clinical trials that proves what works, Mario. But the results live in our journals. Why is it that we haven't implemented what we already know? Take an example of this. Uh, again, in the New England Journal, a cluster randomized trial of blood pressure reduction in black barbershops. Bottom line is it worked. It was successful, Mario. But look at that date. That's 2018. We don't have this scaled and being implemented around the country. Why not? Why not? The results of our research cannot just live in our journals. So we have proposed what we call uh, uh, the heart model, health equity action research, building on first, second, third generation to take action within the community with a health equity lens, acknowledging that race matters and that we must address the social determinants or structural determinants of health. And so here's what it looks like on the ground. Um, don't you remember back in 2001, Mario, I had just been there a year and the federal government launched 
take a loved one to the doctor day. Remember that, my friend. And we looked at all those materials. We said, these are great materials, websites, press releases already prepared. But we said, the folk in the hill, they don't have a doctor. <laughs> the folk out in East Liberty, they don't have a doctor. They don't have a doctor's home. Who are you going to take them to? So we just flipped it on its head, Mario. Remember that? We said, hey, how about take the health professional to the people? And Mario, there may be people in that audience that remembers when we would have that day with, you know, 200 health professionals in our barbershops all over the city, screening 700 people in one day, people going directly to the emergency room and, and, and physicians from the Mayo Clinic coming to Pittsburgh to learn and train with us. Amazing. And here it all is. We're taking you back to the origins. This little barbershop is literally right across the street in the hill. I see Mario smiling there because you see Dr. Kerbo. Uh, she was the first dean that said, let me take a look at this. And this is her young scholar. Uh, and in this moment, right here, you see it happening. You see it happening. And to see Mario now in the School of Pharmacy, <laughs> to see the pharmacy's uh, community pharmacy program, Remember, Mario, we would put the, all the big wigs, the VIPs on the bus and tr take them to the different shops. I can't thank uh, Pat Crowbuff enough. And if she's out there, thank you for believing in us, for taking a chance for something innovative and out of the box. And I want you to see what it has grown to today. And so wicked problems, uh, a lot of people out there, they run from Rick wicked problems. We run to them. And uh, you can see there are the four uh, areas that constitute these wicked problems, incomplete or contradictory information, number of people, multiple opinions, large economic burden, offloading to politicians. We know all of that. Well, we run to those things. And our first wicked problem was uh, colon cancer. And Mario, if I can talk to you about colon cancer, I could probably talk to you about anything. And that's exactly how it worked. When we brought the gastroenterologist into the barbershops and beauty salons, what a conversation. And they loved it. The physicians loved it because they were actually able to finally reach the people that they were not able to reach. Um, Mario, uh, one of the insurance companies did a nice big spread of our work. And you see the title there, the doctor is in. That doesn't mean that Fred the Barber is the doctor. When you read the story, it's that Fred the Barber made his shop open and welcoming to physicians and nurses and other health professionals to come and deliver service. And Mario, what I'd like to do is take your audience into the barbershop right now. Um, give me an idea on time check. How am I doing on time, Mario? Uh, you're doing well, Dr. T. Uh, about uh, five more minutes, would that be good? Okay. And then we can open up Q&A from there. Okay, let me, uh, let me take you inside. I got to stop sharing and come back in. So all of you out there, especially you uh, undergrads, I want you to cross your fingers because Dr. T is going to try to switch to movie, movie mode <laughs> and take you into the barbershop. Mario, did that change? Okay, here we go. Yes, buckle, your, buckle your seatbelt. The barbershop is a sacred space for the kinds of conversations we need to have to move people from vaccine hesitancy to vaccine confidence. Well, when Dr. T first came to me, he made me realize that we are more than just barbers because of the relationships that we have with our clients. Getting the right information to them from behind my chair is a definite way of giving back, is helping the community. Mike sent me a flyer. He said, hey, Dr. T, this is information being distributed in our communities. And the flyer said, COVID's a hoax. Don't take the vaccine. Our communities were marinating in misinformation. I tell them, you know, I, I can understand your concern. Don't disarm yourself. Do your research and make a decision that's going to benefit the well-being of your family and the other loved ones around you. And on May 17th, in Mike's shop, we did the first barbershop vaccine clinic, needles in arms, anywhere in the state of Maryland. It was just awesome to see the people coming in and rolling up their sleeve and taking the position to be vaccinated. I was excited. 
And now I think the barbershop and salon in the black community is recognized as a legitimate place for engaging a population in health promotion, disease prevention. So I've been ecstatic. And if you can give a life-saving injection of a vaccine in a barbershop, why can't we give the flu shot there? Why can't we give the diabetes test there? Why can't we do tele-wellness there? That's the vision. So, so Mario, um, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't take you to the salons. All the stylists are going to be mad at me. So I got one more and how Katrina turned her salon into a COVID vaccine clinic. And then we'll open it up for, 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 for discussion. Hang in there. Cross those fingers again out there. Cross those fingers again. Mario, did that switch? Yes, it did. Okay, here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. Welcome to Shots at the Shop. And today we're at Katrina's Tray Shades Hair Studio in Capitol Heights, Maryland, which has been amazing. My favorite part is um, saving lives, seeing people get vaccinated because a lot of people are hesitant to get vaccinated. So if I can advocate and encourage them, I'm excited to do so. A lot of people just don't trust the system. So we have to take the time to answer their questions. And what better place to do that than in a place they already trust? They can dispel some myths and um, misinformation that's out there. And then they can refer them to others with you know, more specific questions. I've honestly seen about 25 to 30 of my clients go from, no, I'm not getting that vaccine, to so sure, sure, I'll get vaccinated or show up at your clinic on Monday. I got my vaccination. Well, I was comfortable with coming here. I actually feel comfortable here than I would at a normal clinic. I like it because this is, I know this place is not like a strange, it's not strange or anything. You truly are barbers and stylists, a trusted voice in the community. And we want to tap into your expertise and be a good community partner. It's just for us to be knowledgeable in these health disparities so that we can have conversations behind our chair because I believe that we're more than just a hairstylist. We're touching people just like doctors and nurses do. Any barbershop that wants to hold a vaccine clinic in their place of business will find you a clinical partner. So we can bring in all the clinical expertise. I say just do it. Just work on saving lives. Keep um, advocating for the community bringing more people in. And I do believe that having a vaccine clinic at a salon is, is well worth it. It worked here at Trey Shades and it could work in your barbershop or beauty salon as well. Yes, son, you're fully vaccinated. It was a great day. So, so Mario, let's just give some snaps to the barbers and stylists out there. Who are who are making a a, a difference, and uh, let's also recognize that that we can move the needle. We can indeed make a huge difference. And as you can see in these scenes, as we head to the finish line here, uh, we've trained our barbers to do a man and woman in a chair interviews. We we've, we've trained them with our school of journalism so that we can hear direct voices from the chair. And then we answer their questions. Our students are designing like the barbershop health box. Mario, this could work in all the barbershops in the network. The barbershop health box, drop your question in. Then we get the experts to answer your question, but we get the young people that turn those answers into infographics. We did the very first COVID saliva test, FDA approved in the barbershops. Right now, our barbers and stylists can get weekly saliva tests working with our scientists at the University of Maryland. And we've got wellness warriors and health advocates. Mario, when I got that phone call from Laura Ann Bray, who joined the National White House Initiative, Shots at the Shop, and Bats in East Liberty, put needles in arms. Thank you, UPMC. What an amazing transformation we've been able to see. And so Maryland Barbers and Stylists United for Health, we're now spreading this around the country. We want Pittsburgh Barbers and Stylists United for Health, Alabama Barbers and Stylists United for Health, 
Mario, over a decade ago, 15 plus years ago, we talked about this vision. It's happening, my friend. It's happening. And it's with that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to you and uh, open up for comments, questions, and just thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to come back to Pittsburgh. Absolutely wonderful, Dr. Thomas. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for that inspiring talk, um, but doing it in a way that only you can do it. Um, so uh, the chat is blowing up right now with, uh, you already know, it's blowing up. So we have about uh, 15 minutes, uh, maybe a little less for some q and I definitely have a whole list of notes <laughs> that I've taken. And uh, I don't want to take up all the time. I want people to be able to ask their questions. But the first, I do want to uh, just work from the back going forward. You know, two points in this presentation, Dr. T, my, my eyes welled up. The first time was when you talked about Frederick Douglass um, and really just about uh, uh, what we need to do and the good and the bad in terms of communicating uh, what we need to do. The second time was when you really showed how you have continued the vision of the work that we began so many years ago. Um, and it is just so inspiring. I want to quote what one of you, what the stylist said. She said, just do it, <laughs> right? Now we know Nike gets credit for that, but when she says it, it really hits home. And if you could just expand upon that just a little bit, because we know from many years ago, and it still exists today, that no matter how much we talk, some people just don't get, just do it, that you have to immerse yourself. So if you can just talk a little bit more about, about getting past the fear that many of our colleagues have. Well, you know, Mario, one of the things that we've learned, yeah, that we learned in Pittsburgh is that the first phase is just listen. And sometimes you're listening to, sometimes you're listening to being told off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got to be able to take it and not take it personally. When you show up in the community and folks say, you here for another research project? I've been poked and prodded and surveyed and I'm still sick. What are you people doing? You, you got to recognize that you can't say, well, that was so-and-so's department. I'm in a different department. You're one big amalgam as an institution. So what the university does in areas that may be completely unrelated to health impact how the community responds when we show up. So I would say in terms of Katrina and Mike, Fred, all of the barbers that we've worked with here, they were all, hell no, I'm not taking that vaccine. That's how they started, Mario. Hell no, I ain't taking that vaccine. It was simply with time listening, no shame, no blame, that they eventually realize they can make a difference. They never saw themselves just as people cutting hair. They always saw themselves as community leaders. Think of Mr. Wade. We can go down all the barbers who've been on that corner for 40 years. They were local historians. We need to go into the community seeking their wisdom. And then Mario, what we did, we asked, what was your journey? How did you get from hesitancy to confidence? And they will describe that journey. And what we're doing right now, Mario, we have people now that we say are at the hell no wall. Uh, folk who needed convincing have been convinced. But now we got people saying hell no for no reason. And this is the beauty of the barbershop because there's a relationship that they have. They can flush with one another and still love one another because he's going to come back in two weeks. <laughs> and Mario, you know, no self-respecting Black barber had to tell this to our white friends out there. No self-respecting barber would ever say, I get you in and out in 15 minutes. And it doesn't matter how much hair you have, you're going to be there half a day. <laughs> there's no franchise. There's no super cuts. There's no hair cutlery. My white friends say, I go and get my hair cut. I'm in and out in 15 minutes. I don't even talk to the person. I'm on my phone the whole time. So I would simply say this, and you know this, Mario, this is one of the sacred spaces in the Black community. Whatever we do out there, whatever excitement has been generated out there, let's not mess this up. You, you, you don't do this. We make it look easy. But Mario and I know what happens when we'd be on TV and then folks from other institutions would just show up at our barbershops. 
and the barbers had no idea. They thought I sent them or Mario sent them. So you need to protect them as well. So now that we've gone national, uh, the White House has embraced the model, the hair model. Uh, it's called now Shots at the Shop. Uh, we have Shea Moisture Company that put a million dollars on the table to offer a thousand dollars to every barbershop that does a vaccine clinic. That's huge. It's a monumental lift, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's the launch for sustainability, Mario, and a model. And I want Pittsburgh to be part of that national model. Very, very important. Be it Absolutely. Alzheimer's disease, be it once we're in, a whole range of research activities uh, can take place. And I'll share with you, to share with your audience, the publications that we've done on the basic science of microbiome, DNA collection, air quality monitoring in the shops, a whole range where our basic scientists can actually be involved in the community-engaged research. Absolutely. Dr. T, first of all, uh, definitely uh, want to know how uh, we can share your contact information with folks. Everyone in the chat's bone is up. They want you to come back. Uh, they want to know about that, um, uh, the, the training that you have to offer. And all I can tell them is get in line because I have you first. Uh, <laughs> but it, at any rate, we were definitely uh, want to get that information for you. But you talked about having difficult conversations. Um, and it's important to have that. So I want to jump to this one question. Uh, from uh, Jennifer, um, actually from Beth Shaven. And she wants to know what should pit researchers and trainees, many of whom don't know the history, know about Pitt's involvement in the United States Public Health Service's syphilis study, and how should it inform us in our practice today? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I think it's a very good question. When I, when I arrived in, 20, in 2000, you know, one of the uh, researchers of the syphilis study was actually on the faculty in the School of Public Health. Um, Thomas Perrin, uh, who was the first dean, uh, founding dean of the School of Public Health, uh, was Surgeon General of the United States during the time of the Tuskegee study. And over time, Mario, you know, we brought these things up when we were there, and they were con contentious conversations because the people who ran the study became famous. <laughs> These were not just anybody. These scientists who ran the Tuskegee study became famous. And therefore, the, the mentees, their residents, their, the students that trained under them were like, oh, I trained with John Cutler. Or I trained with you. You named the name. It'd be like I trained with somebody who's like very, very, very famous in the field. So that made it difficult to have the reckoning. And in many ways, I think it was the students more than anything. We can talk about the the lectures we had on the topic and all that. But when those students said, I don't want a scholarship with that name on it, all of a sudden now we got, a, we got that next generation moving the needle. I want the students to know they have power. And so the fact that the Graduate School of Public Health building is now called what, Mario? It public health. <laughs> it doesn't call it anything. <laughs> so if that audience doesn't know what it used to be, tell the, tell the former name of the building. Yeah, it used to be called uh, Perrin Hall. Thomas Perrin Hall. Yes. Right there is a history. And the fact that it came from the regents, from the very top of the institution, they recognized it was time to do it. But Mario, you need to know, it was that groundswell over time and the students who made that change. That's not the only there's been a statue to the father, so-called father of gynecology that was taken down. There are, the reckoning is not just with civil rights, uh, Confederate statues. It's also reckoning with racism and discrimination in our own profession. We need to look at it. We need to reckon with it. And we need to recognize that it's time for atonement. Excellent. I'm going to ask another question of you, Dr. T. Uh, we have about three more minutes left. Uh, from um, one of the panel or one of the audience members, what challenged do you think, what challenges do you think we will encounter with the spreading of fear? So uh, I'll, I'll summarize a few different questions. What do people need to know in order to duplicate, to replicate, or to uh, continue this work um, in working through non-traditional sites 
trusted sites in the community. Hmm. Well, I, I think that at the end of the day, it needs institutional commitment. And uh, we, Mario, you and I know, you know the grant psycho and the begging for charity with foundations and you know you get those dollars and when those dollars are gone there's nothing left okay so how do you sustain these i think part of it is we we need a generation of young scholars like like the mario browns and many, maybe people there in the audience who want to pursue this work and you need to know before the pandemic it was not easy to get the health uh, teams to come out into the community it was not easy and um but the pandemic has um, made it a little bit better. So I think this is the pivot, Mario. I think that the science and the literature has been there, okay? But here's what the community is saying. And here, here is our, uh, our chance to step up. The community says to me, Mario, why do they care about us now? Because before the pandemic, they'd see me trying to get the hospital systems to bring their mobile units to do diabetes screening. They, they saw me trying to get the, the health professionals to come in and provide services. And they saw it wasn't easy. But now I got the phone ringing off the hook. Can we bring our mobile unit to your barbershops? Can we do this? And the barbers are saying to me, why do they care about us now? Are they just going to give us the jab and leave us with diabetes, leave us with cancer risks, leave us with obesity? I thought it was very interesting, Mario. They said to me, oh, they just want to give us the, the jab, the COVID vaccine, so we don't spread the infectious disease while we're out shopping, while we're out doing our low-wage essential jobs. But they don't really care about us. If they really care about us, they care about the fact that we don't want to go back to normal. Because back to normal meant Black people living sicker and dying younger. We ain't going back to that. So I would say to you right now, uh, whatever the hospital systems are doing as they geared up to vaccinate people around uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh in particular, the mobile outreach, all the barriers they took down, keep them down, keep them down and make them commit themselves to some ongoing engagement uh, in the community. And the beautiful thing about the Barbershop Network, Mario, is that we know it's a stable business and... Um, these polls are universal. You see these polls all over the world. So this is the differentiator. Those shops that embrace COVID mitigation, those shops that embrace health promotion, disease prevention, those shops that become part of the hair network where the barbers and stylists have been trained. Mario, we got our first three who are now certified community health workers, certified by the state of Maryland. Now that's a game changer. Nice. Behind their chair, they are legitimate frontline health workers. That's new. Yes. And I think that indeed changes the ball game. So what are the guidelines for becoming a community health worker in Pennsylvania? How do we set our training up for the barbers and stylists so that they qualify to meet those state or city guidelines? Absolutely. We're investigating that right now so that we can increase the number of certified community health workers who are legitimate, trusted individuals in the community, and they stay in the community. I think we can do this, but we cannot let our foot off the gas. We have one more wave. Everybody's celebrating right now because the numbers are coming down. Remember we did that with Alpha, spiked the ball on the 30 yard line, and then Delta came. <laughs> They're gonna try to do it again because we wanna get free from this. One more wave is coming. Now's the time to not let up not let your guard down and to get the infrastructure in place for moving to a new future where health equity is truly the goal. Yes, sir. Dr. Thomas, um, as, as a, someone who's been asked to moderate, I must end our talk, our time together at this point. Um, but I do want to say uh, we, we will definitely uh, want to get links to where people can find uh, about how to be trained in the online training that you talked about. People have a lot of questions. I think uh, for the audience, we will compile these questions, get them to Dr. Thomas, and then uh, Ms. Ms. Terry, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lingler, Dr. Kofler, we can then get maybe these responses back to uh, folks in the audience um, and continue the dialogue. But I hope this is just part one and we'll continue to have part two, three, four. <laughs> um, but I want to end with 
something that you told us to do. And I want to say her name, Dr. Susan Moore, Dr. Susan Moore, Dr. Susan Moore. There's a lesson there. Do not forget it. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Honor and a pleasure. Thank you so Later. much. Thank all the organizers. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, very informative and inspiring talk. We thank you for your time and, and your knowledge. Um, and we, you gave us some things that we need to walk away and, and begin doing. So I uh, just want to reiterate, uh, Mario, uh, the comments Mario made about you. And also, Mario, thank you for moderating this session.